Hi, everybody. I'm Jim Provenzano, the Arts and Nightlife Editor for the Bay Area Reporter. For about the past two years, I'm here with Jim Gladstone, John Carr, and Philip Maillard. Uh, John is the veteran first arts editor of the Bay Area Reporter, and Jim and Philip are concurrent and longtime contributors uh, in the arts in various... Jim, you're the theater critic, mostly, and Philip, you're covering dance, and you've done a few other things as well. Um, thanks for joining us, and hi to everybody on our Facebook page with the weird, impromptu, bot-generated captions. I hope I hope my deaf friends are watching, um, and um, and also on YouTube. If you're not seeing this, you'll be seeing it later on YouTube. So I want to talk first. If John, you could head us off and give us a little gossip about the early days of the BAR when you started. Well, I started in 1981. For some years previous to that, Paul Lorch, the editor of the paper, had been sending me out on to be a news reporter, to teach me how to be a journalist. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did a lot of that for several years while impatiently waiting for them to get organized to actually start the art section. Uh, because the one they had was kind of an ad hoc thing full of press releases and anonymous articles, and it didn't have an overseer. So I came in in 1981, stayed till 84, and alienated some writers and brought a lot of new ones on because we needed a, a fuller staff. And uh, what else? I don't know what else. Well, I'm curious about what we're going to show about, actually about a long slideshow of many of the early and recent pages from the BAR through the years. And that's the funny thing you mentioned because I started with the first issue in April 1971 and noticed that it was a jumble. There were very few arts coverage in the first few issues. Right. And there were horoscopes that interrupted, and then there was a gossip column, then there was another gossip column, and then there's a film review in the back. It was it was very hodgepodge until you, you came on board, it seems. Well, Paul, uh, oops. You're if still I, with us? If I open a file on my desktop, can you guys see it? No, it's not like that. I have, <laughs> a, I have a partial list of editors that I could remember. Oh, okay. One, two, three, four, five people. At any rate, Paul was trying to, Paul and Bob Ross were trying to turn the newspaper into a weekly. It was a bi weekly. Right. And that's the reason that there was actually a delay in bringing me on because they weren't ready to make the jump. They were lining up, I guess, more advertisers. I don't really know what they were doing. Um, but finally, they were ready somewhere in 81, and the paper went weekly, and there I was. Um, Paul had been editing editing the arts section, and that's why it was a hodgepodge, because he was actually a, a news and po political writer and didn't have enough time to pay too much attention to the arts section. Um, so it, it was, yes, a jumble. And I was supposed to unjumble it. I think I did a good job. Was it, um, how was the paper produced? I know the early days it was literally pasted together on a kitchen table. But by by the time of your entry, was there a letter set? Was there the processing, the boards? and? Yes. We had a typesetter who worked. He, he typed at a little machine and out came strips of glossy. Column text, right? I don't, I, I don't, I can't remember the words. Yes. Photostat. Um, the end of photostats. Thank you. And we had to uh, rub wax on the back of them and, <laughs> and glue them down to boards. We had the boards laid out on racks along. We had a garage attached to the offices we were in. So along one side of the garage, there were racks about four levels high and the whole paper was laid out there on big boards. A board's approximately the size of the paper itself. Yeah. And we pasted it up, and then the pasted up boards were sent to the printer, who photographed them. I don't know what the printer did. Photographed them and turned them into a paper. Yeah, that was the system a little bit different on Ninth Street up until about 1995 or 96, I think, when they started being able to email electric files. Um, 
you know, yeah. the version of a PDF basically through the mail. It was an FTP, I think was the earlier versions of uh, sending the paper. Um, but yeah, it's funny how we've all kind of lived through the analog era of publications. I was, listen, I was around when we were still playing 78 RPM recordings. <laughs> Dial up. Using practice <laughs> needles. So Jim Gladstone, when did you start writing? Yeah. And when did you start writing like about gay stuff? And when did you start working with us? Oh, wow. Um, I started writing about gay stuff in the, in the eighties um, for the, uh, for a bunch of papers in Philadelphia, the Alt Weekly there, the a couple of gay papers there, um, and the Philadelphia Inquirer, um, as well as the paper at the University of Pennsylvania as well. So, um, and I, I've always been writing about gay stuff. I mean, in addition to other stuff. Um, but I mean, I remember really early on in my, I remember uh, interviewing, um, the Pet Shop Boys when they were first making it and them um, denying um, they were not out and uh, they were denying the homoeroticism in some of their lyrics, um, which I was asking them about. And so um, from that early on date, even some like activist folk in Philadelphia and Larry Gross, who now runs the Annenberg School in LA, um, you know, always said to me, you know, it's great that you just like sneak some stuff in, even when it's not a gay focused article. And that's sort of always what I, I mean, I think I bring a gay perspective to whatever I write about. So, well, Jim, that's, that's of interest to me in a good way. I mentioned a few moments ago, alienating a writer, actually two or three of them, because what I wanted in the paper was. Uh, a gay identity voiced in the writing. And many people were just writing an article that could appear in any publication. And I wanted writing that appeared in a gay publication. Mm -hmm. um, and also that was focused on the community. So as an example, I can use George Haymont, who I I really did alienate him. He was a good friend of mine. Uh, and that was stressful in some ways, but he was running around the world doing opera reviews that came in weeks after the opera had been performed in Rangoon or somewhere. And I said, I said, I want you to do local operas and I want you to bring a gay identity. He was writing to the mainstream and he was able to acclimate to that a little bit, but not do anything local. And so I said, well, you're going to appear monthly so that I have more room for local news. And I had to, that's one of the reigning ins I did of the paper's identity, um, at which he was justifiably miffed, but I wanted gay writers to express themselves in with a gay mentality. Um, I had an arts critic uh, reviewing theater who wrote similarly for the mainstream. He wanted to, you know, um, and he could not cultivate a gay outlook. George did it largely by becoming scatological. And that was one step, well, that was one step closer to a, a gay mindset. Uh, and we worked on it. And, and the arts, the theater reviewer couldn't do that. And I just dropped him. Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting perspective that uh, I was talking to Maria Magenti, the filmmaker and producer, television producer. I'm doing an interview with her about the re-release of her debut film, The Incredible Story of Two Girls in Love, which is a very sweet, endearing film. It was a big hit when it came out. But we were talking about that, about the gay perspective, about how, having to find that, that we just were always doing it. I was doing that since my first article for Outweek magazine that was edited by humble brag Sarah Pettit, the late Sarah, great Sarah Pettit. It was just a 900 review word review of a, a play um, the that ha by Craig Lucas that had it was a gay playwright, but it was about a straight couple. You know, Prelude to a Kiss is gay and it isn't gay, and it was great because I was very out. I didn't care. Got to see Alec Baldwin in his underwear. That's a gay enough perspective. But she taught me. She said very probably very uh, succinctly how to be a gay critic is something that, you know, you say that they're gay or you say something that has a perspective, as you said, 
as opposed to just, oh, there's a naked guy on stage or whatever. Um, and that's where it's different. Um, Philip, you're, you're interpreting dance, which, um, you know, as a former dancer, I just think it's all gay because it's about the body. I mean, not gay in a sexual way, but, and even when there's a male female duet, I interpret and see, you see the body. How do you interpret a dance that appears kind of neutral? Well, I, I have to go back a little bit. Oh yeah, backstory. Go back just a little bit. Yeah, because um, John mentioned the the putting together of the paper, and I was uh, I was in Houston at the time working for a paper called Public News, which was a, a straight paper essentially about um, band listings, mostly band shows, local into you know indie rock, touring shows, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I somehow uh, I got hired as the, like the receptionist. But like with most weekly papers, you do everything. So I was doing classified ads. I was selling classified ads. I was, uh, you know, they had some art listings, you know, where they might just throw together a few listings here and there, but they had never really had arts coverage per se. And this was in the early nineties, so 93. But when you mentioned the the pulling out and the waxing of the papers, of at least you got, at least you got them pulled out in strips. We actually had to cut ours with the, uh, with the exacto knife and I still have scars from, you know, it's like three o'clock in the morning on a Tuesday and you're trying to get glue the paper together. And, you know, you've been working for 14 hours or whatever, but uh, that just brought back such a vivid memory for me. But um, I was really lucky at public news, this paper that the editor uh, was really open to pretty much anything. And I was the only gay person in the, in the building when I started and I think maybe till I finished actually, but I was really interested in the arts. I had danced in, in college and I had performed, in, you know, this experience. And so he really let me kind of do things. And I started to write a few features here and there because they basically just needed to fill space. And little by little over that first three or four years I was there, it sort of became an arts and entertainment publication. And because I was gay, clearly, and I was covering all of this, you know, ballet and opera and theater. Public news had never covered anything like that before. And it, it put a lot of the readers off at first. But I, when you asked me to create my bio, I actually found this, which was my first cover story for public news. And that's uh, Lauren Anderson, who was a principal dancer at Houston Ballet at the time. So... Um, Long before Missy Copeland, Lauren Anderson was a black principal dancer at a major ballet company. And that was the first cover story I'd ever written. Oh, wow. And that was very, like, we got some nasty letters about it. Like, this oh, is, yeah. what, what is this? What is this? Well, this was, think about it. You're, you're in Houston in the early 90s by this point. You know, it was just not, not nasty, but they're like, what is, what's becoming a public news? This is our, you know, but Bert, who was the founder, he had been around since the seventies. He really let, let me go. And the arts coverage and the really expanded. And that's really where I learned the ropes of, of arts journalism. And we were already, there was already a lot of gay people looking at the paper. We knew that and not for nothing, but you know, there were all of the, um, um, how do I put this? Uh, the ads in the back that were for ladies who gave massages and such. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, there wasn't even a word for trans at that point, but I know now that's what, you know. And so we already had the audience sort of there and it really picked up. And I was just very fortunate to be there at the right time. And I got to cover everything and, you know, learn about opera and, um, that kind of led me into my career. And I've been, I worked in arts marketing for many, many, for 20 years. And, um, but I would say from my gay, the gay perspective, I mean, come on, it's the arts, you learn about it. And, um, you know, it, writing for the BER for like, I've only been, I'm new to this group, but I've only been about four years. It isn't like I really felt like I had to change anything. I was already, covering things that interested me and a lot of people involved were gay. And, um, you know, so I bring that perspective to pretty much everything that I do, I think. And, mm -hmm. um, 
it's just been a very interesting trajectory. And I'm really thank you for for having me here today. By the way, it's really <laughs> I always I always dreamed of coming to San Francisco and writing for the BAR long before I moved here. <laughs> so that's great. yeah, yeah. Even when I I moved away for a little while. I moved back to Houston for a few years when all the jobs went away and a friend of mine would mail the BAR to me when I was living in Houston. So I wow. keep up with, yeah, he'd, he'd send the BAR and the guardian and he'd send me all the my local papers. So I'd, it's kind of like I never really left. Oh, I came back. Yeah. This is when we didn't have a website or you just didn't like it that way. You went to <laughs> <laughs> I wanted my paper. Wanted yeah, my paper. we we have. I understand there are people who do that. Yes, I love it. Okay, let me let me get just like show an, your friend Mr. Fillmore again. I really enjoyed Mike Hippler's writing. I feel like he did a nice job of providing a gay lens. Yes, point of view. And John, you agree? It, well, I, oh yes. Not only was he exceptionally good looking and a very sweet fellow, but had that gay point of view just cooked into him. That's just how everything came out. And he was a very good writer. Paul Lorch is the person who brought him onto the paper. Mm -hmm. I had never even heard of him. Um, so I don't know if he came to the paper seeking a job or if Paul met him or whatever, but his column first appeared in the news section where I believe it remained. I don't think it came over to the arts section. But it was ultimately collected in a book, his individual columns. And he was the epitome of how you can express uh, a gay point of view mm -hmm. or see it, in, see it in front of you out of material that's totally heterosexual. Oh, okay. You know, like pop movies. There's not a gay person anywhere n near them. But if you're a gay person watching it, you can have that reaction. Is, is it the idea of the outsider looking in, or is it about camp or finding camp in, in a straight situation or unintentional well, homoeroticism? What is, what is the, gay, the queer eye? I think all three of us could comment on that because from what I can tell from Jim and Philip, it's all of our eyes. And I was thinking for a moment, maybe it's a generational thing that I had to get rid of older writers um, who were still in the 50s or so. I don't know what it was, but it was a trend that was going on. Um, there were people looking for um, for the gays in religion, in, well, I can't express this. In all the arts, they were looking for the gay angle. Mm -hmm. You know, what is it about that that strikes me as a gay person that I can express to my readers? Mm, okay. So in, in many of my reviews of pornos, I dealt with the issue of what is masculinity, you know, uh, and how does porn represent it, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So you, you can do the same thing with a play or a book, or, you know. Yeah. But also when I was coming in, that was the time of an expl the explosion of gay arts. There were gay books being published, <laughs> you know, there was something you could really look at. In the opera world, I could see George's difficulty because no one was writing a gay opera. That took years to come around, but... For Benjamin Britten and et cetera, yeah. Well, they were cloaked. It was gay, but you didn't say that. Yeah. That's the interesting stuff, yeah. No one was writing an opera about Harvey Milk until <laughs> much, you know, that sort of thing. Actual right. gay content. Right. So I'm going to, speaking of actual gay content, I'm going to start our little slideshow. I had tried off camera to collect these properly as PDFs, but the capacity for size limitations uh, is uh, too big, which is not in my vocabulary, but uh, apparently it is in StreamYards. <laughs> so um, I'm going to start with our early issue. Sorry about the moire, and we're moving into this. And you guys can comment or just like, giggle this is the cover of the very first issue of the bay area reporter april 4th 1971 i don't know why they were promoting a circus but it was a benefit so they did and uh let me get to the next picture if i can can i possibly uh wait get to the thing 
Uh, quick look. Yeah, usually you can share this as a PDF and then. Okay, so th this is amazing that this, in the first issue, the first arts review is of a straight film called Husbands with John Cassavetes, Peter Falk, and the always gorgeous Ben Gazzara, which I find very interesting because we were just talking about finding man's love for man in the straight world, says the subcaption, or the, the kicker, as we say in the industry. So I just thought that was interesting. And this is literally typed, hand typed on paper. And it was, like we said, copied and pasted literally onto boards. Uh, but I thought that was interesting that the first arts review was about a straight homo social film. And this is difficult to read, but there was a plethora of books that apparently J.D. Miller in issue, in the first issue decided to share. And I'm, I was breezing through it, skimming through it, and like The Lord Won't Mind uh, and a few others. But they weren't gay fiction because there was not that much gay fiction to mention. Um, everything you always want to know about sex, of course, had its homophobic bits. But I just find it interesting that this hand-typed multiple book review, he couldn't find gay fiction, but he, you know, read through the, between the lines. Here's the July issue of a review of what looks like a frighteningly comic version of Tommy, the Who opera. And here, does anyone remember Michael Greer? Oh, pa sure. Patron saint in my office. He was, here's the review of the film adaptation of the stage play, Fortune of Men's Eyes, the drag, prison sex, and rape-filled drama that brought Don, Don, what's his name, to fame? Don Johnson? Yes, yes, it was his big break. Now, now this is one of the most ridiculous nom de plumes ever. Gugger Pinto. I, I don't know if it's a pun on Googie Gomez from the Ritz, if that was out yet, but this is a mention of a production of Lone Mountain College's attempt to perform our Orpheus Aegon and the Rite of Spring. As a former dancer, I don't know if I would have wanted to have witnessed that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's just a little too precious, a little too. And here's another weird nom de plume, Paul Ravel, do reviewing, and it goes on for a whole another page. His review of Jesus Christ Superstar, a touring production that played at the Circle Star Theater, which probably no longer exists. And here's an example of porn being on the front page to lure you in to read about actual news. Uh, Casey Donovan, of course, in Boys in the Band. Now, this is Donald McLean, more Michael Greer on the right, who w was also a, a drag persona who was on All in the Family. We discussed that in a previous chat that you can look up on YouTube. But this seems more of a, of a hodgepodge of different things where this is where the kind of unbridled editorial style was the, 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 the contributors were allowed to just ramble on about whatever they wanted. This is a predecessor of Sweet Lips. Yes, yes. I and mean, he is talking about showbiz itself and celebrities, whereas Sweet Lips would talk about bartenders on and the same level. But I just the royal court. Right. And this guy's really entertainment. And a little more closer talking about an actual film, the film adaptation of Cabaret, of course, with the great Liza Minnelli. Reviewer's tip, if you're planning to attend on a weekend, make sure you arrive at the theater plenty of time. The lines are long and it's cold on the street these days. Thank you, Margaret Ann, <laughs> whoever you really were. And speaking a different cabaret, this is what the paper was mostly filled with in the first years was nightlife performances, semi-drag, drag, but a lot of cabaret coverage, not so much theater um, uh, until, again, Donald kind of stepped it up. This is films and all kinds of things here. God, remember when the Four Musketeers, they were all so young. And ACT doing Three Penny Opera. Uh -oh. It was the w most terrible production ever. <laughs> really? I'm a Three Penny Opera fan. I don't walk out of theater just as a rule. Right. Just, you never know what's in the second act unless you see it. But yeah. I walked out of that show. Mm. I went across the street to a soup and salad restaurant where my boyfriend was working had a glass of white wine, and then walked back into the theater. Having made my statement of walking out, I went <laughs> back and saw the second act, and the really great stuff was in the second act. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh. That'd be a lesson. <laughs> a question for, for Jim and, and John. Um, all of these sort of nom de plume that we're seeing, I understand from what you said that some of them are 
folks where they were writing lots of articles, so they used different names. Were any of them folks who didn't want their name to appear in the gay newspaper? Yes. Mm. Not knowing not knowing some of these nom de plumes we've seen, I can still say yes. Uh, just because I had some writers who wanted a nom de plume um, for fear that uh, people at their job would find out they were gay and they'd lose their job. So they couldn't have their own name in a gay publication. Wow. That was not unheard of. Um, wow. And it's one of the reasons I always insisted on using my own name, even when writing about porn. Of course, right. I wasn't going to lose my job. I was working for a gay newspaper. Right. But um, that's one of the things we were doing at the time was being out. Yeah, yeah, that uh, very different and important. Here's a, a little still from Spartacus about a very now talk about a gay gaze. Spartacus and in a ballet version. So one of my favorites is ballet dances about gladiators. And on the right, an ad for Tommy the film. This is amazing. You can get the two records for six dollars or nine ninety nine. I forget. Yes. Um, what company is that that did the Spartacus? Uh, the epic Spartacus Ballet will be staged by the Bolshoi during its visit this year. Oh, they were touring. Yeah. Yeah. So there's that. Um, but the whole use of capital letters to, in, in, mixed in with articles to me is a bit disturbing, but I understand it because they couldn't italicize things easily with the, Well, no, some things are italicized. Anyway, moving on. I love this cover. This is another case of porn and politics literally next to each other. Here's a uh, uh, and the paper had for a while in the seventies, the front page was reserved for a, an ad. So you couldn't get, you didn't get editorial on the front page. Uh, King Kong and the, and the debut of Jessica Lang, of course, with some makeshift ads. I love this. That's kind of funny. Just, it's just cute. Um, now here's Don McLean. He apparently was the theater reviewer for quite a while and ACT doing their Christmas Carol for quite a while as well he was kind of a go-to writer wrote about a lot of things yeah i did read a few and they're actually quite eloquent and they do say you know the acting large company is uneven to be kind and he goes on through politely trashing the, sh the production as well as <laughs> as well as deservedly trashing you know delorentis's king kong but i love how below that is an ad performance performances the ads always amaze me waylon flowers and madam martha reeves you know, these people coming into town and making history. And John, here's your column from 1976. Talking about Hello, Dolly and the Broadway musical, the golden age of the opera, or no, the musicals. Now here's, well, here's, this may be an interesting tidbit. I was looking at my own photo up in the masthead of yes. that article, <laughs> which it was there not out of, to assuage my own ego, but we were paying the writers so little they were getting a couple of peanuts and a graham cracker and i said well let's just put everybody's picture with their article so that they will gain some renown in the community okay because that's that's something i could do so for a long time photos ran with with anybody's article okay did that help help did what get, i think did so you get stopped on the street and people said i love your write-up oh, of hello dolly oh. Yes, that's true. I I did get stopped on the street. Oh, I read your column all the time. I like it a lot, blah, blah. Yes. Good. Okay. Well, I'm glad that helped. Um, more Don McLean. There's Tommy Lee Jones when he was cute, which is a long time ago. He's still cute. Okay, if you say so. That's a guy. Um, the Betsy. Now, this is seeing the, the queer eye. You know, they could have probably chosen from 10 photos that were mailed to them in a press kit or they found this somewhere. But, of course, the one photo that they would use that Don or whoever was putting the paper together was, of course, a shirtless photo of Tommy Lee Jones. That's obviously the gay eye. That's the more overt gay eye. This two-page spread, also in 1978, is amazing because it includes Liv Ullman, Bobby Short, a hair removal ad, <laughs> and the club bass notes, the Hotel Paradise in the upper right. A thriller of the film. Again, it just all looks very gay to me. I love it. Here's the aforementioned George Haymont, opera writer, writing up a production of Aida in 1978. Now, I never understood the whole gay obsession with opera that some people have. Um, 
I guess because it's just over the top. Much like Judy Garland, it's big, it's emotional. Yeah. Okay. Not my thing. And we discussed this in the film panel, but this was a pretty pivotal moment in hit in arts history. Was of course the film version of Cruising with Al Pacino. Mm -hmm. For the kids. The film was uh, based on a book about a cop who goes undercover in the leather community to find a serial killer and gets a little gay and obsessed himself. Um, it was protested in the streets while William Friedkin was shooting it so that they had to overdub all the exterior shots because of the whistles that were blowing off set. Um, it was heavily boycotted and turned out to be actually quite a good film, according to some. I was a part of one of those demonstrations. Oh, okay. I just happened to be in New York and we heard a big ruckus going on down the street. And we said, let's go see what that is. And it was a demonstration outside of a bar against the filming of Cruising. And yeah, they were making as much noise as possible to interrupt it. So that's, that's the worst parts of the film are when the exteriors are all overdubbed. And it, it, it actually feels like a porn movie, which is unintentional. I'm sure William Friedkin didn't want that on purpose. But um, anyway. So I, I'm... I just want to butt in maybe just to get some some wisdom from folks who know more. Um, so I remember when this came out. I mean, I was I was a kid. What what year is it? 70? 1980. Okay, 1980. Okay, so I was 15. Um, and I remember it came out, and I remember there was all this protest. And I guess even now when I think back on it, I feel really surprised that all the protest against this film was by gay people instead of straight people protesting that the film was existing and, and being mass marketed. I mean, frankly, I can only imagine gay people going to see this film. At the time, I think most straight people just weren't paying attention. If, they, if it came to their attention that something was gay, they just dismissed it from their thought. So only gay people who were just forming, uh, or they were solidifying their political presence in the world. Mm -hmm. So yes, they'd be the ones to pick it. And why do you think, um, I mean, so I remember what I heard was that, uh, and this is interesting too, I heard that it was being protested because they felt that focusing on leather people was a misrepresentation of the gay community as a, as a whole and it painted us black, if you will. Um, and it, I, I, it's very interesting to me because really recently here in San Francisco at the Eagle and also at the Atlanta Eagle, um, in Atlanta, their Eagle, which just became a historic landmark, um, is the first gay historic landmark building in Atlanta and in the whole deep south. Okay. And, and I asked the folks who were involved in the historic preservation bit, they said nobody made any noise about why are we picking a leather associated place as the first um, as the first landmark. And I would have thought that even now that would have um, stirred up some some gay people. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, it doesn't take much. I, th I think historically to refer back to cruising, I was again out by that time pretty much in college, but it was a highly visible moment in the unintentional way in that seeing gay people angry in a post Harvey Milk assassination, Dan White, those all were impacted to people of our generation, I think, because we were, if we were distant, we saw it on the news and we saw empowered, mostly white gay men in jeans or leather jackets, burning things and tearing things down. And that was really shocking and empowering and, I didn't care about the film. I, I found the book at a, at a you know convenience store. It was a dollar ninety nine, and it was oh, it's about a serial killer. I get it. The same way, in 1990, you know, Catherine did it with uh, Basic Instinct. That it was it was women and lesbians and bisexuals turns to protest. Um, but I was fascinating culturally. But a shitty movie. I don't know. I mean, it's. There had been decades of television of people like John Davidson playing a psychotic transgender, not a crossdresser, murder on streets of San Francisco. That was the pattern. Other than Don McLean, who we referenced, who was an editor and writer with the paper, 
his drag character on All in the Family was murdered in the second episode. Yeah, where I remember was. that. Yeah. That was that was pretty common. The tragic gay trope was pretty common in television at the time. And so to see TV coverage of protests about cruising from New York was just, for me, it was a magnet. It was like, oh, wow, okay, they exist. And some of them are hot and they're angry. And they're not just being the stereotypes that were given. So, yeah, pretty pivotal days. Let me get back to the slideshow, and we will move up to, sorry, the messy version of, ah. Um, so cruising, go watch it and rent it today, kids. You'll find out a little bit of gay history and what whistles are for. Um, this is another interesting double-page spread of a little, a little cluttered, a little crazy. I don't know what we're supposed to look at, but the, the Smothers Brothers you, star in a musical sex comedy. Now, anyone can put the gay gays on that. That'd be interesting to see what that's about. What is that here? crazy ad in the bottom right? I can't read it. I can't read it either. It's F-O-C-C. -C. When your Jaguar won't cornhole and your glory hole won't 18 on. <laughs> E-O-C-C. -E -C. I have no idea what that is. East, I do. I do. Boy. But it was it. Took a while to sink in. The East of Castro Club, oh. which was um, in a cubby hole. Uh, there's a... a a popular bar upstairs of the gas station at market and 17th. Okay. Um, and in a little cubby hole behind it facing 17th street was the East of Castro club, which um, teeny place showed uh, porn. Oh, okay. and allowed sex on the premises. How nice for them. Well, praise the Lord. <laughs> and had a <laughs> And had a real artiste who showed the movies. He had projectors, slide projectors, uh, film projectors, tape recorders. He had a whole bank of equipment. And he would layer things. When you were looking oh. at the screen, things would melt. Oh, he was an artist. Oh, like Bruce Conner, like collage kind he of would, He would do mashups. Oh, my God. And they were really incredible. Wow. All from that ad. We need to write about I need to get Michael Flanagan, our... Barkhive historian columnist on well, that. Um, who, who was the well-known manager of the Knob Hill Theater? For Cliff Newman. Oh, okay. Cliff's, it was Cliff's Club. Okay, taking notes. He was Sorry. the uh, he he presided over the projection booth. Wow, I had no idea. I just I barely looked at that ad because I couldn't I couldn't read it at all. Uh -huh. There was, a lot, there was a lot of angel dust being smoked in that. Oh dear, that's un <laughs> that's unfortunate. <laughs> okay, this I love this page because you can't see it very well. You'll have to go on archive.org and look it up. But it's not arts as much as it is the BAR writers presenting their favorites through the year. I've referenced this before, but included in this, it's not entertainment, but it is. It's entertainment, but it's more of a anyway. The dog show, which includes Shirley MacLaine, popped in as a guest, an MC. And if you look in the middle, you can barely see a dog and a guy in leather who won the prize for being the hottest. Uh, anyway, that's really cute. It's a year in review. This is a little better resolution of Fossbinder's Corel with a feature article and conveniently an ad for the, the, Brad, the late Brad Davis. There's no byline. That's odd. It probably fell off. <laughs> Well, unlike other less reputable papers in the Bay Area, we uh, you know insist on a byline because that just is ethical. But I, I bet you it just fell off because those were always clipped on, often clipped on a little late. Uh -huh. um, I don't think anyone should be embarrassed about a full page spread about Corel um, and on the right La Traviata and El Rio. Now I don't understand this. Who was Ronette with fourteen? Oh, Ronette was a writer I brought in. He was. Um... A genius with his own remarkable voice. And I was just publishing his essays. I had him review certain things. Okay. When City of Night reached, what is it? Was it its 40th anniversary or 25th? He wrote a large essay about its importance. Uh, and he was, to, to pay the rent, he was a waiter at the Bohemian Club. <gasps> and he wrote, he wrote an inside expose of a gay man at the Bohemian Club, and it ran in five or six issues. It was so long. Yeah. And that was before Armistead Maupin wrote about the Bohemian Club? Oh, yes. So maybe someone got an idea from someone else? It's possible. 
Okay. <laughs> And on the right is a little uh, dance. I can't. I, I'm sorry, I can't zoom in. I was going to take notes, but it looks like that's uh, why I keep peering into the screen there, so I can. Yeah, sorry, the technology <laughs> isn't isn't there yet. But I love the illustration for Ronette's story. I'm glad to hear the backstory. Another double page spread of of Black Theater. Um, uh, John Carr on the left. You wrote this story. South Africa is everywhere. He was just an incredible writer. Yeah, that's a joke. Oh, okay. Because it's me. <laughs> I thought you were still talking about Ronette. Uh, anyway. Oh. <laughs> I like the plethora of ads. I mean, you can see Lauren Bacall in Woman of the Year. Ah, good coffee. Um, another double page spread from 83. There's not only an opera, there's dance, and there's a review of. You now, this is a great idea. This is cr cruising at the Coliseum of the David Bowie show. This is right when he was going, quote, straight, you know, with the. Uh huh the new look, the 80s look that was very prescient and predicted all the trends changing, but to cruise at a David Bowie concert when he is no longer, quote, gay or, or no longer Ziggy, I'd like to zoom in and read that. Can you, can you make out the byline on from fifth position? Uh, the from fifth position is Seth White, Keith White. Keith White. I couldn't remember his name because I okay. can't remember anything. I brought him into the paper ah. and he was... He was, I think all dance writers should go back into the archives and read his articles because he had a gay viewpoint of what an arabesque meant. Oh, okay. When he, when, when a gay person looked at it, he was, yeah. The What's his last name again? Keith. White. Keith right. White. He died of AIDS. Like many, yes. Yes. So we and a, a hint on, on looking up stuff on the on archive.org, Bay Area Reporter, is if you're looking for a specific name or writer, like Michael Lackey here, look, use the word by in double quotes, or else you're just going to get their name in the masthead over and over again. Oh. That's the thing I told all the writers. Here's a, the, the documentary Mayor of Castro Street, a write-up, and uh, the late Randy Schultz, the writer who inspired the film, which became, of course, later on, much later on, a narrative film. We're a little behind schedule, so I'm going to go a little quickly. Doris Fish on the lower left, and the cor Gay Men's Chorus, a, a standard in the art section. Just There was a makeover here where the art section kind of had its own banner. Uh, basically, this. Now, um, you're writing on the right, John, you wrote Yek and No about... Yetch. Yetch and No, okay. A dismissive term. I wonder what I'm writing about. Well, you trash Rocky Horror Picture Show in the first two paragraphs, which really put me off. But I understand why. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then you go on to some show that, that these people, these unfortunate people in this cliche-ridden publicity photo. That's one of the things I can tell the backstory about. When we used to get actual mail and we get these actual black and white photos that we photostatted and reduced in size, they all looked like that. They were all, oh, look at us being surprised at something off camera. There's nothing worse than bad theater PR photos. And there were hundreds and hundreds of them. And we all threw them out. When the paper moved, we had buckets of them to throw out. Most of them of Sharon McKnight, but <laughs> <laughs> and she, she's adorable. We love her much uh, like but, Don, much. She is heterosexual. Don McLean obviously isn't. But the thing they have in common was that they were indefatigable in serving the gay community. Sharon yes. did more benefits. If there's a benefit for a gay cause, she's there. Yes, and you can you can As look up. So was Don. He was right. the MC, the ubiquitous MC of everything for some years. You can look up uh, 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 Sharon's chat with Mark Abramson, the producer of the Men Behind Bars concerts on YouTube on our or on our Facebook page, where we gave her a special pre-recorded segment because she's worth it. Um, heading into the '90s, Patrick Cocktail wrote about the pivotal Marlon Riggs documentaries and films here, shown with Essex Hempel. Was th happy to have met both of them on a few writers panels, a uh, few writers conferences in the in the eighties and nineties. Um, there, were, accusations often flew to the paper about it being too white, too male, and I would agree that the, the many of the years were that they were not as diverse as they could have been. So, well, diverse. When we first, when the paper started, it wasn't aimed at anything other than gay men. Um, it was only many years had to go by before we started developing a consciousness that a gay paper needs to encompass the entire gay community, which means women. Right. 
You know, they had been totally disregarded for some years. Yes. So yeah. a apropos of that last piece you had up. So, you know, last week I had that interview with Coleman Domingo. Right. And um, you, I, I think, uh, you know, to get a sense of the theater history of San Francisco the last 30 years, um, that's sort of an amazing piece. And that's a guy who worked for basically every company. Um, yeah. And um, and his first piece that he sort of wrote or adapted was an adaptation of, of uh, that Essex Hemphill um, anthology. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, his the way his career is intertwined with the history of San Francisco theater is pretty interesting. Yeah, I was really glad you submitted that feature. It was great to have him part of it. This is just gratuitous nudity with artist Elwood Miller. Remember when they had sex art salons at Eichelberger's? Anyone remember Eichelberger's? In the, that was that was quite the place. And up on the left, I say this mostly while well, Sharon McKnight, the ubiquitous Sharon McKnight on the upper right in a classic pose for one of her uh, shows <laughs> reviewed by you, John. Of course. I, I was a psychophant. I followed her around. Okay. And on the and left. Upper left, yeah, Margaret Cho. And Josie's Cabaret and Juice Joint. Margaret Cho with wow. Mark Davis. That's that's gay history right there. It God, is. I adore her. I interviewed her like five times, I think, with different publications. This is when I was doing the calendar. and you, The fold in the middle is just from scanning. There's a ripple in the scanning. But I was so thrilled to have collage art like the John Hartfeld dog, the hyena at the top. But as soon as I saw that, I kind of went out of control. But uh, for two years, I did this listings, tried to dress them up. And we had a lot of cutting and pasting to do to uh, really visualize and have a good time with the weekly listing, something that I still do 30 years later. And this is uh, an example of Adriana Roberts' full makeover of the paper, the, the from the banners to the fonts to the colors. We started injecting monochromatic color, different colors every week in the mid-90s. And that's just a visual example of that. And uh, it, it really took on a different look. Adrian shows these bolder fonts. He uh, changed the column width. Uh, he just basically did a whole renovation that was necessary, and uh, and I think a good a good thing. I'm just amazed uh, this 1995 pa double page spread of all of the phone sex ads that were. Yeah. <laughs> they really supported the paper for they a while. Did. Yeah, it's they so did. interesting. Same at my paid paid the, paid the paid the payroll many times. Yeah, I just wonder what Margaret, what um, Miss Melissa Etheridge and her agent thought about, you know, having their photo right next to Colt Morgan. I, I just always think, and that annoying one on the upper left of Chase, Chance Crawford constantly showing off his ass. I just, that ad was in the paper for like 10 years. Well, this is, here's a story about the growth of the paper. Um, a famous story, the SF Opera yeah. put, put down a mandate that their articles or their ads, their ads would not appear next to a sex advertisement, right? period. And that's one of the reasons that the back of the paper was invented as a section. Sexual material had often been put near the rear of the paper, but now it was codified into Bob's Bazaar. Right. And porno and sex ads and sex, sex talk lines and everything was now put back there so that it would not dis, it would not alienate Adver uh, advertisers. Yeah, the same pattern was done when I was in New York with Outweek Magazine. We moved, of course, it was funded by 550 Tool and Kendall Morrison's phone sex company um, from the beginning, but there was a move to move it all to the back and then segregate it. And then they said, well, we want to separate it into a, a pullout and uh, and and we want you to edit it, Jim. And I was like, okay, fine. We'll call it Hunt. And then they were like, no, no, no. We're gonna have everyone's gonna vote on a name for it in the office. This is Sarah Pettit, Walter Armstrong, Dale Peck, all these people who all went on to much better things. So everyone did a vote in a tally, and of course, it was Hunt. It was like I I knew it immediately in five seconds because it was listings. Plus, it was the phone wow. sex. Plus, it was the the personals ad. So you're on the hunt. Duh. Um, and then the advocates stole our idea and did it much better because they included graphic porn. They included the photo nude shoots, which became men. That whole segregation thing has been going on for 35 years for me personally, doing these things and being, oh, I'm in the back of the bus again. So I understand the pattern. But I also knew immediately when Michael Yamashita, our current publisher at the BAR, said, 
we want to start a nightlife section and do a, have it be a pullout. And I was like, deja vu. Well, we can't call it hunt. Okay. We'll call it bar tab. Kurt, can you make a beer coaster as a logo? And he, he immediately understood it. So it's been a benefit and a kind of a hazard to be in this business where I'm always the guy they ask to make up a name and take the back of the bus. And, uh, but now I get to merge the nightlife stuff and the art stuff. And unfortunately we're not still reviewing porn because we're not. Thank, sorry, John. Um, and the Knob Hill is dead, so there's no porn stars to interview because they're not coming to town anymore. So there's that. Anyway, let me go back to the stream, the olden days. Enough of my rant. Hi, Clive Barker. I want to get to the period when Philip and Jim come on the scene. Well, I was freelancing. By this time, I was I was doing the sports column freelancing and uh, working for evil.coms in, in the dark ages of the internet boom. And Roberto Friedman was at this time, 19, we're up to 1996, the assistant arts editor to Chris Caldwell, who couldn't make it tonight. Um, Roberto wrote this lovely article and interview with Andrew Holleran, the, of course, the author of Dancer from the Dance. Lovely guy. There's more creativity from Adriana Roberts with fonts and film festivals. And here's <laughs> briefly arts editor and frequent contributor Robert Julian's write up of the phenomenon of porn actors taking to the theaters, the legitimate oh. theater, as it were. <laughs> Here's Ronnie Larson shooting porn. This is a very artistic, I love it. it. This is a gay gaze. Elizabeth Ashley as Diana Vreeland in a, in a biofilm interviewed by, or written about by Richard Dodds, who uh, was our former theater review, theater reviewer and film reviewer. He's now living in palatial Palm Springs. And on the upper right, Jewel Gomez. Um, it, this is in, ab, in Chris Cullwell's absence. Piffy Galore is also someone who I forget who what their nom. It, that was probably uh, oh no, it wasn't. Never mind. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Mark Martin took over my job as the calendar editor, and so did Roberto. Here's a lovely creativity. Obviously, when you have a limited space, you have to pick the best stuff, and we would get these press releases in the mail colored pink photo photocopies. Um, we, we didn't even have email. This is the 90s. We didn't have email yet. So you get printed press releases and you pile them up and you pick what you're going to use and then you pick the best photos. And I just love this layout because the patterns here between the tattoos, the mod fashion, and the and the illustrated tiger, it's just a brilliant idea. It's a brilliant layout. And um, and that's, that's the kind of fun aspect you can have. Here's another brilliant of Robert Julian writing about about Tammy Faye Baker, of course, but yeah, I love that. <laughs> the way Adriana decided to put the text in the crucifix is yeah. again brilliant. Thank you, Fenton and Randy, for starting that trend. Another great layout for the calendar with Mark Martin having taken over. I never liked doing those essays on the left, so I pretty much got rid of those as soon as I was able to. Well, here's this is why this is why the paper used to be a jumble. Nobody ever thought of having uh, a layout person. What do you call that? An art Production artist. designer. Production designer. We didn't have one of those for years. It was <laughs> nobody. <laughs> nobody knew what one was. <laughs> I, when I was editor, I did the layout, and sometimes it was good, and right. sometimes it was good. You know. Yes. So yeah. For the paper to get, and to be able to afford uh, that, a person in that job is great. Yeah, we were. I don't know. Even I was after your time. But certainly, you, you were doing it all. I was taking the thirty dollars for the classified ads while I'm writing the art review and cutting out the paper and <laughs> figuring out Page Maker. I think it was. It was like page, oh you know, that's you know, and you just figure it out and try not to cut yourself. <laughs> yeah. Well, this. If you look at the dancer, the new dancer on the left, upper left, this is Adriana doing in Quark 2.0. Yeah. Whereas in the years before, only two or three, five, four or five years before, we had to do that manually with the yeah. typesetter. You know, you you indent according to the shape that you're trying to do. So we didn't do that very often. But that was through the ease of Quark that Adriana was able to uh, make that magic. And here's a little more severe. This is actually, I scanned this, I screen kept this the week of 9-11. The art section really didn't budge. It didn't, it had already had these things planned, but again, the text is pouring itself into the boy's t-shirt, which is very clever. Um, 
I didn't notice that. Didn't notice that first. I did. Again, full color. Hooray! Full color on the front page. Rare. It's more frequent. Um, again, back to monochrome and dance and film. A lovely two-page spread. Now, this is where here's a feature on Mambo Italiano, and on the right is our ad for Mambo Italiano. We usually maintain a kind of ethical stance of, okay, we're <laughs> going to review it anyway. Thanks for buying the ad. I'll just let the public know that. Um, again, another lovely cover of films. Hey, Always Jim, in these days, can I ask a question? In these days, because I can only go by my own experience, the amount of color was dependent on who actually bought ads that week. Yes, right. You know, oh, we can actually exactly. afford to do a color this week. That color, full color there happened because of a gay.com ad on the back of the section I did not screen cap. So you're exactly right. It really, right. they want this exactly. color. Yeah, we also rotated the colors when it was monochrome, but you know, like today's, this is like fuchsia or whatever. Um, now columns on the left, Roberto would have his column with name dropping various things that didn't weren't worthy of a full article usually. Um, some magic theater, gay theater on the right. Again, another lovely full color, Alec Mappa. He was here in here as a pride. Hey, go back a page. Um, out there, Roberto's column. He's, mm -hmm. he's a, very, a very witty and entertaining gossip columnist. Um, when I started writing, I wrote a lot of articles because space needed to be filled and we didn't have all the writers. So, and, I start, and with my emphasis on community focus, I started a thing called Who, What, When, Where, which was little... If somebody was having an art show of his photographs in a coffee shop somewhere, I would call them up and do a little interview over the phone and give them a couple inches and some obscure book. Or once I found um, uh, hot peppered peanuts being sold under the, under the brand name Hot Nuts, spelled with a Z at the end, Hot Nuts. So I did a little comic thing about that. Um, because that was happening in San Francisco. But I, I was able to, on a weekly basis, at least give some, at least testify about community members. And that grew when I left and Roberto took over, that grew into his out there column. Oh, okay. Which he, of course, changed and transmogrified um, in his own way. It's great. So that's, that's the story of his column. That's amazing. Yeah, I wish I had time for that. Now we just retweet. Yeah. And somebody wants a few inches. Sorry, here's a retweet. So Carr is saying, Mr. Fillmore again, Carr, that was the place with glory holes, right? They're going back to, yeah, we've already <laughs> been there. We mentioned that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I remember sex in San Francisco. Does anyone remember sex in San Francisco? Yes. We have to visit our porn column where John and Cornelius and I talk about that. Now I'm jumping ahead we're, because we have a dearth of uh, scanned papers online uh, to the old website. It's a little out of, out of focus, I'm sorry. But here's Richard Dodds covering uh, oh. a Gabler. Oh, um, was my, these, I, I have to interject here. These two shows, Head of Gabler, thank you for including this, and Kiki and Herb were my husband of now 15 years. These were our first, Head of Gabler was our first date. It was, not a, it was it was not a good choice for a first day. <laughs> no, given the plot. <laughs> uh, no, and I should have known that since I had marketed the show when I was in Houston. But, uh, um, John, I'm curious when you talked about, uh, you know, you never know what's going to be in the second act. Um, I'll never know what was in the second act of this particular production because it was our first date and we were both trying to be nice to each other and pretend like we were – entertained and we weren't so we left it in our mission i don't leave either <laughs> I, I, I don't either but it was at a, that was... stage of the game i was an employee of act and i was dressing renee oh really re i really revered her performance i thought she was a great head up she's good i just she's it good. wasn't a good for it wasn't a no. good first date no <laughs> <laughs> I thought it'd be really sexy or something. I don't know what I was thinking, but not Hedda. No, that's funny. I'm so glad I picked that. I didn't know it had that connection to you, as well as Kiki and Herb. Much better oh, yeah. date night material. Oh yeah, yeah. That was 
Yeah, angry drag is always a good idea for a, a date. <laughs> now, I just love this photo, obviously. I think it's a, I'm sure, pretty sure it's a Rick Earharder, um, but David Lambel writing about the, the Castro's 100 years, and of course, given presciently given the future of it and the recent <sighs> controversy over coverage of its transformation, as well as the actual facts of what's going to happen to it as a music venue, will be interesting. And we'll do our best to cover it in the future. Um, switching back to the website to one of my favorite exhibits at YBCA was the Nick Cave costume exhibit. Yeah. So that was the first show I worked on when I was at, uh, at YBCA in the marketing oh. department. It oh. was great. It was really, really fun. Um, except, well, and then we were simultaneously doing Nick Cave's, that was his first solo exhibition. And he's, oh. of course, huge now. But um, the sisters of Perpetual Indulgence were also doing a celebration of their, I guess it would have been their 30th or 35th, whatever, it was a big anniversary year. And we yeah. had an exhibit, we had an exhibit of their, uh, their work in the small gallery. So there were these great parties. We did a, a parade of all the sisters flew in from around the world. Yeah. And uh, they came down and, and paraded through the Nick Cave sound suits. And it was just an unbelievable, I was, it was the first time I was like, I've, this is really a San Francisco night. It was peak. It was really peak. I mean, and I'm, you know, pretty picky about my, you know, but it was a great event. I remember going to the, the party night and YBCA, which just blew up. It, it's, it's really, I, I looking it forward to it. night. Yeah. And Sora Wood, who is not um, writing so much for us now is mostly focused her last five or 10 years on visual art. And here's a, just a screen cap of the top part of the, her review of the Richard Stein exhibit. The Armistead Mark Maupin Tales of the City musical adaptation. Not a critical or financial success, but I adored it. I loved it. Yeah, <laughs> did you work on this, John? I certainly <laughs> did. There were a lot of costumes. It killed me. It's the last show I did there. Oh, sorry. <laughs> You're a dead. Sorry. <laughs> I had a real um, uh, clash, artistic differences with my production direct supervisor. Okay. Um, he had never done a Broadway musical, and I oh. had, and oh. it was disastrous. Um, and okay. so I, there. We'll, Next. we'll come back to that, yes. No, we don't need to. <laughs> no, or not. <laughs> And here's a dance uh, critic, or mostly ballet, but dance critic writer Paul Parrish uh, discussing Smoon Ballet. And, and now, now Philip, you reminded me of this, that this article, look it up, the September 27, 2011, because he talks about Smoon's departure, um, as well as other issues related to San Francisco Ballet that we won't go into either, um, because I want to play catch up. Um, back to me, Bartab. I got to interview Caswell, who I knew back in New York a thousand years ago when he was just Caswell, and he was uh, he was kind of bumping back into fame into the with his uh, hot singles, "No Selfie Control," and uh, well, it was it was about a year or two after Ice Cream Truck, so he, he was still coasting. A lovely fellow, I adore him. He's sweet and funny, and talented. Peter Hernandez did not write for us very long, but he got a lovely interview with Tony Award winner Lashans. Um, she was singing. Now, this is again where I'm kind of filling the gaps of stuff that didn't fit in the art section and would go into the, the Bartab nightlife section. Now, I thought in the Cockettes, the show became uh, other things. I did a, that's the Thrill Peddlers. Yeah, I did a backstage feature where I, I went to, I got to go early and see them getting ready for the show. And that's kind of, you know, I'm comfortable in that environment having done it dozens of times through my youth. Um, but they were a fun crew. They were really festive even before the show. Um, <laughs> they and much more festive afterward. We can't have a nightlife or art section without lesbian folk singers. And to have Chris Williamson head up the section that week was a true thrill. Brent Calderwood, who's also a musician himself, he uh, pitched this story about a music festival that was pretty far away, but you know, we as we were doing more stuff online, oh no, it's Cern Grove, that's not far, Outside Lands. He, he, a queer music festival was, was staged in Upper Lake, California. I began to expand the parameters of what we covered and when, where it would take place because our online presence was expanding by, this is 2014. 
So, and also our readers, even though most of them are men, I, I wanted them to know that this music festival was going on. And my God, Chris Williamson, um, lovely array of visual art here that Roberto chose with Sir Wood uh, and Paul Parrish discussing Garrett and Moulton, um, one of my uh, other favorite modern dance companies. Dance, we have a, a cater of publicity photographers, press photographers who take like RJ Muna, who I, I swear that's probably his, if I can, I can't see that, who dance photographers and theater photographers who make our lives so much easier because they're brilliant. Uh, and RJ Muna, it should just, I, he's won awards for his photos, but um, every time I get one of the press releases from the company that hires him, it's like, well, that goes in the calendar because it's so beautiful. Um, and there's a variety of things. It's a disability performance festival I covered above the fold and Jay Rodriguez, of course, he was in town with Joshua Clip who frequently wrote for us and some more, some, Women jazz players are lovely Jason Brock and Katja Smirnoff Sky, who collaborated on concerts. Shine Jackson, and this is one of Michael Flanagan's archive stories about the old nightlife that I and entertainment that I just can't resist photos like that. They're just too 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 cool. And Jim, you could, this is your you got to interview Shine Jackson for this. Yeah, what what year is this? We're in 2017, uh, April. Oh, okay, yeah, that was well along, yeah. Can you I give us a sound? I don't remember this land, but it's very nice. Can you give us a sound bite about Cheyenne? <sighs> Was that a fun interview? Um, yeah, he's a little, um, little, um, you know, new agey. Um, ah, uh, yeah. Um, you know, he's 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 recovered many times. <laughs> right. Yeah, I got a bit of that in my interview, but I, 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 I dove back into talking about Xanadu. It was when he was doing, uh, I think, Feinstein's had just opened, or yeah. it was something else. So, yeah, adorable fellow. Right, here's some lovely squares. Sir, talking about the art, and David Elijah Nemad, who refused to do our panel because he doesn't like to do video chats. So, but he's a nice writer. He's a good writer. So, double visual art. We're moving up to 2017. I just love this cover. The way, notice the way. Either Kurt, who was designing the paper, or Roberto in choosing these. I love the royal looks and the decor decorations and the diverse, you know, the opposite and similarness of the subjects. Yeah, it's great. And the way that they're arranged. It, it just, sometimes these things just fall in your lap. But Philip Campbell, who's done marvelous opera reviews over the years, as well as symphony reviews and write ups, and Sora and the visual arts, and the two just combine. This is where. It's, I think it's a tribute to Roberto Friedman's, his gay gaze that is not necessarily gay. Cause gay this, gaze, that's the term. Yeah. Again, it's, mm -hmm. it's is it Madame a Butterfly? Turned out, it turned out, and a, a, an indigenous tribal portraiture, but put together in this fashion, I think it's a gay gaze. <laughs> I'm sticking to that, anyway. And uh, this is where I got to get Sari Staver, who usually used to do our pot column. I think that's discontinued for now. Um, and we've got a got an article about or got quotes from Pussy Riot, which is more relevant than ever they are these days. And David did a piece on Queer Tango, a social group. So again, um, this is the colors. I think this is about the blues, the, the lovely combination. Angels of America, did we all see that? The revival one? Did we all, Jim, you saw it. You wrote this. You got yeah. me with I the mean, queer eye And the amazing thing about that was, um, you know, Randy talking about um, that Angels in America was the first um, play he ever saw on Broadway, and Stephen was was in it. Right, um, Stephen Spinella. Yeah, and I was interviewing them together, and it was really interesting because um, Stephen had didn't didn't know that. Um, how formative that seeing that show had been for for Randy, who went with his mom to see it, um, you know, when he was a kid. So that that was super neat. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's... I interviewed them. To I sat in the room with the two of them, and you know what I hoped would happen did happen, which is I got a lot of them playing off of each other. 
Oh, okay. So look that up, folks. The April 2nd issue, or the second week of April, uh, uh, The Great Work Begins in Angels in America, where Stephen Spinella does not reprise his role as prior Walter. He is Roy Cohn, Roy Cohn which br the most case of brilliant generational casting. I got to see Stephen in the original Broadway production, and I will take that to my grave. I will humble brag that to my death. It was a brilliant piece of art. Um, and here's Jim, you're writing about oh, our Bestie Awards. Now, this is something that, you know, I'm going to try to beef up once we have actual Bestie Awards and things. It, it, it pretty much falls on the shoulders of nightlife, but I want more arts Bestie nominations and categories because um, uh, I, I just like this cover. I think it's brilliant. I think it's very vibrant. And uh, we like to celebrate the arts. That's what we do, as Jim did in your nightlife write-up this year in and Justin Vivian Bond, lovely purples compared to Mark Morris's new dance of the year in 2018. Again, a wise choice by Roberto Friedman. Oh, look, they go together. Arms raised. Yeah. Lavender? Would you call that lavender or purple? Purple. Okay. <laughs> and an Andy Warhol exhibit that Sora wrote up. Another Sora exhibit of jewels. That was an interesting exhibit. And uh, some more visual art. And here we are, pandemic time. I have to go to the news section to show that we are in 2020. And what did the arts do? Well, not much just yet. <laughs> Here's Michael Dilson Thomas, Mark Crowley, and Lucy Arnaz. Um, not really reacting to the pandemic just yet, except I did in the se section. This, is, this was thought up by Max Le Legere, our new production guy, Entertainment in Place. He, that was homing in instead of going out. So the big transition I made was, here's some stuff you can do that you don't have to go outside. Um, streaming plays, musicals, you know, uh, uh, Mad Max was, I think was streaming at the time. Anyway, that's what I did. I moved forward into the online entertainment. There's a double, lovely double page spread of books with the adorable Eric Cervini compared to the adorable and elderly Larry Kramer. They have it. Oh, look, ads for my books as well. Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> That's called filler, people. Uh, this is the pride issue. So we had a lot of extra space because we had a lot of extra ads. But I was just happy to be able to have the expanse of the old days where you have like a 60 page issue. And here, Philip, is one of your write ups about Smoon Contemporary Ballet. It's great. There, I, I've re-engaged myself with that company the last few years. I, okay. I think they've, I think they've really reinvented themselves. Mostly with Amy Seiwert or with other choreographers. Both, both. I, I, I was, I, I did the story. The first one I did for the BAR probably like 2017, 2018, okay. um, about the Johnny Cash ballet. Of, oh yeah. Yeah, that was uh, James good. Kudel James Kudelka did it, and I walked in that studio to watch them rehearsing, and I was like, "What is this company? This is not what I remember Smooth Ballet looking like." And since then, I've just, I've really, uh, I'm just, I'm a big fan now. I think they're, yeah, it's amazing how they continued. I think they're, they're, they've done. They were the first ones to do go back to live performance too. They figured out a way. Right. Uh, I love this layout because because I can. Here's Tim Pfaff, who wrote about Lil Nas X, and the adorable Darcy Drollinger as Frank N. Furter in a revival of a stage production of the Rocky Horror Show. To be able to just do this, this is why I love my job. I can go, I decide to do this. I'm going to completely indulge in the visuals of the paper this week because it's there. Um, so anyway, why I love my job. Um, and again, here's another Brian Bromberger who was writing, I think, for several years, but he, he loves to write. He's our nude resident film writer, and he's talking about the documentary about David Wanarovich, who I will humble brag and say I knew in New York in the old days. Um, Greg Shapiro is also Below the Fold, a frequent contributor for many years, more than I realized until recently he explained to me, um, music reviews mostly. And here's a combination, obviously, of frame line. Udo Kier in Swan Song and Above the Fold is Nightlife blending in lovely. I think these two go well together. I'm sure they would. I would love to see an interview, like interview magazine style between Juanina Moore and Udo Kier. I think they would really enjoy each other's company. 
<laughs> and again, because of thank you, our dear advertisers, I was able to indulge Frameline Film Festival and show all these publicity stills from multiple films. And Brian Bromberger's article was 3,000 words long. Wow. Don't do this at home, kids. I divided it into two sections. Here's the other section. Documentaries, including the... Oh, and look, some more ads for Michael Nava's book. And so is mine. Oh, dear. Okay, so we're up to 2021. And Jim, you're doing the fall arts preview. Yeah. That was a lot of work, yes? Yeah, I'm trying to remember how much of it was canceled. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's just say probably a lot. Um, yeah, I mean, we're still, everything is still sliding around. I mean, <laughs> it's amazing. In the last two weeks, I mean, uh, ACT canceled the Lehman um, trilogy or pushed it back a year or so. Yeah. And Berkeley Rep um, moved a major piece of theirs to, to next year. So it's it's really the aftershocks of this thing are just continuing. Well, there is one uh, one silver lining to the epidemic. Uh, ACT canceled their production of the Rocky Horror Show. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, I did, I did a shadow cast in college. I will defend that horrible, wonderful show to my death. I'm There's not speaking about the quality of the show. I'm just talking about its appearance at ACT. Okay. All right. All right. Well, on to the classics. Here's some. Here's San Francisco. In Bill Campbell did a preview of many of these shows were postponed. Uh, classical music, you know, shows. But I did get to see Jonathan online. He's an adorable pianist who I adore. Um, the new conductor. She's pivoting, and of course, our Oscar. Multiple Oscar nominated West Side Story remake had to get into the fall film previews. Uh, unlike on the right, House of Gucci, which I think I fell asleep while I was watching a bootleg at home. I'm not going to, don't quote me on that. Uh, again, we're able to, Philip, here you are um, with the I dance roundup. Did. Hooray. I think, I, I think almost everything went forward. I think almost everything. Yeah? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Probably Hispanico. Well, or, Philip, I've been reading you for, I've read all of your stuff <laughs> and I always thought, gee, this is a really good writer and never realized it was you. Oh, very nice. Thank you. God knows yeah. who I thought it was, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I often get confused with uh, writer Jim Piotta because we're both Jim P's. Here he's talking about our last year's fall arts literary works of merit of which there were many. That's the great thing. Books were just being pumped out left and right because you know they can be read quite easily. Um, and I love this this section cover as well because Cornelius got an interview with Martha Wash who had a new album out. Movies, visual art, Jim on the right you did Shotgun Players. Oh on yeah, YouTube. that was a really interesting, that was a really interesting show. It was really like performance art, right? Yeah. It really was. It was about Malvina Reynolds, who was the singer songwriter who wrote the Little Boxes song, which is a famous song that oh. was not performed in the show. Oh, okay. <laughs> Pete, I, I knew about that on Pete Seeger's, I think it was an Electric Company episode. Anyway, Philip, here you are, you are giving the lovely Excuse service me. to Ballet Trocadero de Monte Carlo. They were great. They were great. It's really a privilege to be able to, and Max took it to, you know, he, he see he expanded the columns to four and to be able to give that much space to a deserving photo and all the work that goes into putting their little arms in front of the photo text, that 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 can't be done quickly. I love it. I love it so much. The contrast with the butchness of Brian Hutchinson's uh, podcast, Below the Fold, it's just one of those things. Um, and there's some lovely musicians and film Having space like this, having print space, and these are thrilling when the, when the ad you know rate goes up and you know you're able to do all a full version in print of the article. It's an honor and it's also fun. But sometimes I'll indulge online with if there are multiple videos or whatever. But having a space like this to show th a four column version of the San Francisco Ballet photo and similar to Jim here to your Zako dance coverage. That's the, we long for it. We long so. Buy ads so we can do this more often. I think that's it. Yeah, that's like a month old issue. So I'm going to kill that. And uh, 
car was that? We we got some more Mr. Fillmore. Oh, we already did that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I just love doing that. Is he talking about the East of Castro Club? Yeah, yeah. He, that's an old comment. Sorry, we're getting low viewership. So that, it was the only person other than a spammer that's in the comments. So that's okay. Uh, so anyway, that's that's a, a lovely overview, kind of historic overview of the visual look and style and the space that we had in the paper, and uh, the, and and a good demonstration of how the paper grew in sophistication. I hope so. The year, over the years. The quality, so. the quality of the writers who were engaged. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, that that's part of it too is that being able to see over the years how to write. I learned how to write. You know, it was you have to write to get better. Um, if yeah. I, I look back at some of my early '90s material, and it's embarrassing, but hey. I got to interview Chief Rivera three times. I think I got it right by the third time. You know? uh -oh. <laughs> so what are some of the things that you guys look forward to doing or in the future having had these uh, experiences in writing? What are other things maybe that you want to talk about? I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm sure I can. Yeah. Go John, go first. You're the elder. No, I'm not. Uh, I'm not looking forward to doing anything. <laughs> okay, that was quick. So it's, this is uh, up to Jim and Philip. <laughs> over to over to over to what, Jim? I think you know one of the most challenging things about writing criticism, no matter how much you love the the field that you're criticizing, is that um, is how do you make it fresh to you as as a writer? to go in there and sit at, in another proscenium stage and see another show and write about it. And I think about sports writers, you know, who go to 85 baseball games a year and write about what in some sense is the, is a, a variation on a theme. Um, and, you know, I, I never know from the reader's perspective. I mean, unfortunately we don't, we don't hear from, readers like maybe the paper did in the past um oh you haven't looked at the facebook comments oh <laughs> is that where they are that's where they all roost now oh okay <laughs> oh because, I didn't know. yeah I, i'm very unaware of of uh, i feel like my articles go out into into a black hole yeah um, and, and i'm okay with that um because a lot of the time often when it's negative, but particularly when it's negative of something that's starting here with hopes of going on, I mean, I actually hope to give some constructive ideas. Um, you know, I don't know if uh, anyone's going to go to a show when, if, when I write a positive review of it, but I, I hope that the people who are making the shows, um, if they read it, um, maybe I say something that makes them happy or maybe I'd say something that makes them think a little more. There's a, there's a lot of things that, that start here with the hopes of going on that, you know, are in triad and they need more, more, more work. I mean, the play yeah. at the, that Avid brothers piece at the Berkeley. Oh, Rock, swept away. Yeah. Which, you know, was spectacular in a lot of ways and then really lacking in, in, in others. I and mean, it was such a, such an interesting, um, piece um and and i wish that people were um you know more sharper in their not in sharp not criticizing it more sharply but more specific in in the feedback they gave i mean i feel like one of our opportunities as a as a critic in a you know place where a road show might start before it makes its way to broadway is that we you know i can at least fantasize that we have a way of contributing yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, except for Vampire the Stat, which should have died before it was born. You know, Head Over Heels was another one that, you know, when it actually when that played here, I thought um, I thought it was going to be a success in New York. Yeah. And I actually think it was it was a it was more of a San Francisco show than a New York show. Hmm. OK. Um, well, yeah. Well, I love that Wicked grew here. You know, I saw the the nine hour version and I loved it, <laughs> <laughs> and I love the new version and I love it. Um, but yeah, that's the fun part is when you get to see something the progress. I mean, the Angels in America had like 
three or four different iterations yeah. uh, through its life. And I would have loved to have been able to see the early bits um, that Steven Spinell actually talked about in a, in a 1980s um, interview with him and Tony Kushner, where they talk about prior Walter and the early stages of it. Um, Philip, do you have, I mean, some other things in the future that you're planning, other publications or a book? Well, or I, I come at it, I think, from a really uh, different perspective because I've never been a critic for as as such oh. i could write i can write a crit a, a critique of a of a dance work I, I would say just because of my background but i really because i ended up um i started on the journalism side and then i went over to the other side and doing marketing and pr and i did that for a long 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 time and so for me I really see it from both sides now, and I don't know that I ever want to do criticism anymore because I'm way too involved. I understand what is going on on the other side. Wait, it's too. Uh, John, I'm sure you have, you know what I'm talking about here, but um, it, I just it breaks my heart to to say anything but positive things because I, everyone's working so hard, and it's you know I'm way too emotionally attached. Well, you can't you can't review intentions. Right. Nobody, yeah. nope, nobody, right. wants, nobody wants no. to, to create a flop. No. It just happens. So, <laughs> but uh, I mean, what I think I uh, what I love about doing this work is that um, I can I can actually pr help our community. You know, I can actually these companies, and that's why I love doing previews. I love doing an interview with an artist of any kind, an actor, dancer, painter, anything. Yeah, and I can actually hopefully. Uh, contribute to the ongoing success of whatever, whether it's good or bad, you know, yeah. I can, you know, I think it's up to people like us to perpetuate uh, and, and to keep the arts alive, especially right now. Um, Cause they're, everybody's even, even the big boys are, are struggling, you know? Um, and I think it's, our, we can play a big part in, in helping them make it to the other side. I, and I love I love it. It makes me it makes me very happy to think that if I can write a little something and, and help them move a few put a few butts in seats, it makes me very happy. Yeah, that's one of the um, shifts I made since taking on the arts editor position is I'm more as you both know, and John from reading is that I'm more about advanced coverage, butts in seats, you decide whether it's good or great or sucks. But I want to, people to know in advance to make plans because we have to be more careful making plans these days. Um, even if it's a streaming, you know, addictive, binge-worthy series, get it out in advance. A critical review to me is not as crucial these days, but I'm still publishing, obviously, the writing of Jim and, and Brian and others who do that because sometimes something just really sucks. It's surprising. Um, but a, a, or a, a critique of West Side Story is important because everyone's critiquing it, whether they're informed or not. So um, that's fascinating, a discussion to have uh, as well as promoting something. Um, but yeah, it's fun. To, it's fun. To just like like I just finished the uh, listings today late, a day late uh, for me. And it was like, sorry, you didn't make the cut. And I feel terrible for the 98 press releases that just were in the maybe bin. They just didn't make it this week because I had to prioritize the ones that I had time for. And that's unfortunate, but there are very few other publications and websites are doing more than 10 or two, 10 or 20 best ofs. You know, here's some hot things to do. And they're not comprehensive. They're not queer. And they don't fill in the details. And I know everyone who sends in a press release, please send it uh, in time because I want to include these things. But if it doesn't get in a time, if I can't read it, if I don't know what it is, it's frustrating because this is what we're about. We're about saying, and this is why I clarified the writer's guidelines. What is it? It's Lady Gaga steals, choose every scene in the film House of Gucci. And we got like 44,000 views because I put Lady Gaga in the title. <laughs> so that's an aside, but I'm really more about directly saying, you know, San Francisco Ballet you know, has a new film thing that they're doing and, and getting to the point instead of obscuring what it is we're talking about and being clever. Um, because, yeah, it's about that. It's about letting people know, hey, this thing is going on. Go see it. If it, Let us know if you like it or not. But anyway, we're kind of getting to the 90-minute mark, and I think we're running out of gas. So I'm going to thank the three of you for participating thank with you. your eloquence. And uh, before we all break up in our 
Wi-Fi dies off. I'm going to bid you all good night and thank you again. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Live, thank you, Jim. archived. Bye-bye. Jim and thank Philip, you, Jim. I'm so glad to meet you. <laughs> well, we'll be meeting in 3D very soon. And <laughs> Mask Patrol, okay? I'm ending broadcast very 